Hey, hi everyone, welcome to this video on Windows Server 2012. It's been a little while since I've done a video, so here we go. Um, Active Directory. Now that you are familiar with domain name system DNS, you need to verify that the computer you upgrade to a domain controller DC meets the basic file system and network connectivity requirements so that Active Directory runs smoothly and efficiently in your organization. Next, you'll explore the concept of domain function levels, which is essentially which essentially determines what sorts of domain controllers you can use in your environment. For instance, in Windows Server 2003, domain function level, you can include Server 2012, 2012 or 2, Server 2008 or 2, Server 2008 and Server 2003 domain controllers, but the functionality of the domain is severely limited. Once you understand how to plan properly, for your domain environment, you will learn how to install Active Directory, which you will accomplish by promoting a Windows Server 2012 or two computer to a domain controller. I will also discuss a feature in Windows Server 2012 or two called a read only domain controller or DC. After you become familiar with the initial Active Directory installation, you will learn how to install and configure application directory partitions. These partitions provide replica data repositories using the Active Directory paradigm, but they don't actually store any security principles such as users or groups. As the name implies, you use application directory partitions primarily to store data generated by applications that need to be replicated throughout your network environments independent of the rest of Active Directory. The final section of this chapter deals with integration and DNS with Active Directory. You learned about DNS in Chapter 2, Configure Network Services, but in this chapter, I will review how DNS implements with Active Directory, verifying file system, sorry, verifying the file system. When you're planning your Active Directory deployment, the file system that the operating system uses is an important concern for two reasons. First, the file system can provide the ultimate level of security for all of the information stored on the server itself. Second, it is responsible for managing and tracking all of the data. The Windows Server 2012 or 2 platform supports two file systems, Windows NT file system, NTFS, and Resilient file system, REFS. Although REFS was new to Windows Server 2012, NTFS has been around for many years and NTFS in Windows Server 2012 has been improved for better performance. If you have been working with servers for many years, you may have noticed a few changes to the server file system choices. For example, in Windows Server 2003, you could choose between FAT, FAT32 and NTFS. In Windows Server 2008 or 2, you could choose between FAT32 and NTFS. In Windows Server 2012 or 2, you will notice that all versions of FAT have been removed. See figure 3.1. Resilient file system. Windows Server 2012 now includes a new file system called Resilient File System, or EFS. Or e FS was created to help Windows Server 2012 or to maximize the availability of data and online operation. REFS allows the Windows Server 2012 or 2 system to continue to function despite some errors that would normally cause data to be lost or the system to go down. REFS uses data integrity to protect your data from errors and also to make sure that all of your data is online when that data is needed. One of the issues that IT members have had to face over the years is the problem of rapidly growing data sizes. As we continue to rely more and more on computers, our data continues to get larger and larger. 
this is where REFS can help an IT department. REFS was designed specifically with the issues of scalability and performance in mind, which resulted in some of the following REFS features. Availability. If your hard disk becomes corrupt, REFS has the ability to implement and salvage strategy that removes the data that has been corrupted. This feature allows the healthy data to continue to be available with the unhealthy while the unhealthy data is removed. All of this can be done without taking the hard disk offline scalability. One of the main advantages of REFS is the ability to support volume size up to 278 bytes using one using 16 KB cluster sizes while when those stack addressing allows 264 bytes. REFS also supports file sizes of 264 minus one bytes, 264 files in a directory and the same number of directories in a volume. Robust disk updating. REFS uses a disk updating system referred to as an allocate on write transaction model, also known as copy or write. This model helps to avoid many hard disk issues while data is written to the disk because REFS updates data using disk writes to multiple locations in an automatic manner instead of updating data in place. Data integrity, REFS, uses a check summed system to verify that all of the data that is being written and stored is accurate and reliable. REFS uses, always uses allocate on write for updates to the data and it uses checksum to detect disk corruption. Application compatibility. REFS allows for most NTFS features and also supports the Win32 API. Because of this, REFS is compatible with most Windows applications, NTFS. Let's start with some features of NTFS. There are many benefits to using NTFS, including support for the following disk quotas. To restrict the amount of disk space used by users on the network, system administrators can establish disk quotas by default, Windows Server 2012 or 2 supports disk quota restrictions at the volume level. That is, you can restrict the amount of storage space that a specific user uses on a single disk volume. Third-party solutions that allow more granular quota settings are also available. File system encryption. One of the fundamental problems with network operating systems, NOS, is that system administrators are often given full permission to view all files and data stored on hard disks, which can be a security and privacy concern. In some cases, this is necessary, for example, to perform backup, recovery, and disk management functions. At least one of the users must have all permissions. Windows Server 2012 and NTFS addresses these issues by allowing for file system encryption. Encryption essentially scrambles all of the data stored within files before they are written to disk. When an authorized user requests the file, they are transparently decrypted and provided by using encryption. Um, you can prevent that data from being used in case it is stolen or intercepted by an unauthorized user even a system administrator, dynamic volumes. Protecting against disk failures is an important concern for protection for production servers. Although earlier versions of Windows NT supported various levels of redundant array of independent disks, RAID technology, software-based solutions had some shortcomings. Perhaps the most significant was that administrators needed to perform server reboots and change to change RAID configurations. Also, you could make some configuration changes without completely reinstalling the operating system. With Windows Server 2012, 
or to support for dynamic volume system administrators can change RAID and other disk configuration settings without needing to reboot or reinstall the server. The result is greater data protection, increased scalability, and increased uptime. Dynamic volumes are also included with REFS. Mounted drives. By using mounted drive system administrators can map a local disk drive to an NTFS directory name. This helps them organize disk space on servers and increase manageability. By using mounted drives, you can mount C colon backslash users directory to an actual physical disk. If that disk becomes full, you can copy all of the files to another larger drive without changing the, changing the directory path name or reconfiguring applications. Remote storage system administrators often notice that as soon as they add more space, they must plan the next upgrade. One way to recover this space is to move infrequently used files to external hard drives. However, backing up and restoring these files can be quite difficult and time consuming. Systems, system administrators can use the remote storage features supported by NTFS to offload seldom used data automatically to a backup system or other devices. The files, however, remain available to users. If a user requests an archived file, Windows Server 2012 or 2 can automatically restore the file from a remote storage device and make it available. Using remote storage like this frees up system administrators time and allows them to focus on tasks other than micromanaging disk space. Self-healing NTFS in previous versions of Windows Server operating system. If you had to fix a corrupted NTFS volume, you used a tool called CHK disk exe. The disadvantage of this tool is that Windows Server availability was disrupted. If this server was your domain controller, you, that could stop domain logon authentication. To help, to, sorry, to help protect the Windows Server 2012 or two NTFS file system, Microsoft now uses a feature called Self Healing NTFS. Self Healing NTFS attempts to fix corrupted NTFS file systems without taking them offline. Self-healing NTFS allows an NTFS file system to be corrected without running the CHK DSK.exe utility. New features added to the NTFS kernel code allow disk inconsistencies to be corrected without system downtime security. NTFS allows you to configure not only folder level security, but also file level security. NTFS is one of the biggest reasons most companies use NTF, NTFS. REFS also allows folder and file level security, setting up the NTFS partition. Although the features mentioned in the previous section likely compel most system administrators to use NTFS, additional reasons make using it mandatory. The most important reason is that Active Directory data store must reside on an NTFS partition. Therefore, before you begin installing Active Directory, make sure you have at least one NTFS partition available. Also, be sure you have a reasonable amount of disk space available, at least four gig, because the size of the Active Directory data store will allow, will grow as you add objects to it. Also, be sure that you have adequate space for the future. Exercise 3.1 shows you how to use the administrative tools to view and modify disk configuration. Okay, exercise three one viewing disk configuration one. Press the Windows key on the keyboard and then choose administrative tools. Two, double click computer management. Three, under storage, click disk management. Four, use 
the view menu to choose various depictions of the physical and logical drives in your system. Five, to see the available options for modifying partitions, right click any of the disks or partitions. This step is option six, close computer management, verifying network connectivity. Although a Windows Server 2012 or two computer can be used by, self, by itself without connecting to a network, you will not harness much of the potential of the operating system without network connectivity because the fundamental purpose of network operating system is to provide resources to users. You must verify network connectivity, basic connectivity tests. Before you install, before you begin to install Active Directory, you should perform several checks of your current configuration to ensure that the server is configured properly on the network. You should test the following network adapter. At least one network adapter should be installed and properly configured on your server. A quick way to verify that a network adapter is properly installed is to use the computer management administrative tool under device manager network adapters branch. You should have at least one network adapter listed. If you do not use the add hardware icon in control panel to configure hardware TCP IP, make sure that TCP IP is installed, configured and enabled on any necessary network adapters. The server should be given a valid IP address and subnet mask optionally. You may need to configure a default gateway, DNS servers, WINS servers, and other network settings. If you are using DHCP, be sure that the assigned information is correct. It is always a good idea to use a static IP address for servers because IP address changes can cause network connectivity problems if they are not handled properly. Internet access. If the server should have access to the internet, verify that it is able to connect to external web servers and other machines outside of the local area network LAN. If the server is unable to connect, you might have a problem with the TCP IP configuration LAN access. The server should be able to view other servers and workstations on the network. If other machines are not visible, make sure that the network and TCP IP configurations are correct for your environment. Client access. Network client computers should be able to connect to your server and view any shared resources. A simple way to test connectivity is to create and share and test whether other machines are able to see files and folders within it. If clients cannot access the machine, make sure that both the client and the server are configured properly. Wide area network access. If you're working in a distributed environment, you should ensure that you have access to any remote sites or users who will need to connect to this machine. Usually this is a simple test that can be performed by a network administrator tools and techniques for testing network configuration. In some cases, verifying network access can be quite simple. You might have some internal and external network resources with which to test. In other cases, it might be more complicated. You can use several tools and techniques to verify that your network configuration is correct using the IP config utility by typing IP config forward slash all at the command prompt. You can view information about the TCP forward slash IP settings of a computer. Figure 3.2 shows the types of information you'll receive. Figure 3.2 viewing TCP IP information with the IP config utility using the I sorry, using the ping command. The ping command was designed to test connectivity to other computers. You can use the command simply by typing ping and then enter an IP address or host name at the command line. The following are some steps for testing connectivity using the ping command. Ping the other, sorry, ping other computers to the same subnet. You should start by pinging a known active IP address on the network to check for a response. If you receive one, then you have connectivity to the network. Next, check to see whether you can ping another machine using its host name. If this works, then 
local name resolution works properly, paying computers on different subnets. To ensure that routing is set up properly, you should attempt to ping computers that are on other subnets, if any exist, on your network. If this test fails, try pinging the default gateway. Any errors may indicate a problem in the network configuration or a problem with a router. Browsing the network to ensure that you have access to other computers on the network. Be sure they can be viewed by clicking network. This verifies that your name resolution parameters are set up correctly and that other computers are accessible. Also try connecting to resources such as file shares or printers on other machines. Browsing the um browsing the internet, you can quickly verify whether your server has access to the internet by visiting a known website such as www.microsoft.com. Um, success ensures that you have access outside of your network. If you do not have access to the web, you might be verifying. You might need to verify your proxy server settings if, if applicable and your DNS server settings. By performing these simple tests, you can ensure that you have a properly configured network connection and other network resources are available. So I'm going to leave it here today for this video. If you like listening, please consider like sharing and subscribing. Thank you.